So this is the thematic session 12 of the annual meeting of the Alliance, second day, and we are going to look uh, uh, specifically at how COVID uh, impact and tackled and exacerbated uh, risks for uh, children in armed conflicts. So uh, here we have uh, uh, two presenters and lovely panelists from World Vision International and Save the Children Internationals, and uh, I'm going to introduce them. But uh, before moving on, please, if you can, let's, uh, let's try to use the Zoom feed, type it with a reaction on your screen. So you can, you have down six types of different reactions that you can use. So, okay, this will help us to understand that, uh, first of all, participants are alive. So, um, thank you all. And so, first of all, let me introduce my facilitator of this session. So you will see me around trying to support the conversation, particularly in the, some of the breakout rooms that we are having. And I am the CPA advisor at Plan International UK. So as a part of the global search capacity, I'm supporting the scale up of emergency works in some of the most vulnerable and fragile contexts. Uh, and uh, my life motto, if you can interest in is like think global and act local because I'm bridging frontline workers with global initiatives and vice versa, exactly because part of my job is totally dedicated in uh, country uh, based uh, location, but still working with the global networks and initiatives, particularly for the Alliance. I am a member of the CPMS working group, the Child Labor Task Force and Cash Transfer and CP Task Force. So before starting, just some housekeeping information. As you can uh, see from uh, a small light that is happening uh, in the screen, uh, so this uh, uh, session is going to be recorded. But uh, we really value your open and transparent opinion and the, the fact that you can feel relaxed in expressing yourself, that's why uh, please be aware that uh, even in breakout room, we are not recording. Only what is happening on plenary, it will be recorded for sharing because uh, we would like that even people who have not been accessed to these sessions because of uh, limited number can still in the future access and uh, learn from the topics and from our experiences. That's why you are encouraged to talk and the session is recorded except the breakout area. As you can see, there is a hand signal. You can use that to raise your hand in case you have technical glitch or you want to express or talks. Uh, this is a really encourage a participatory uh, session. So please uh, uh, express yourself, add uh, your own experience, uh, help us uh, to make this more relevant as much as possible to all the different contexts that uh, we have been all as a participants working here. We invite you to keep your mic on and your camera on exactly because this is a remote uh, annual meetings. It's not uh, a remote uh, workshop. That's why we, that we really would like to meet you as much as possible. So help us to give a face and a name to, the, to all of you. What uh, we would like to encourage is that uh, English is not uh, our mother tongues for that reason. Also, if you have some challenges in understanding, we are happy to repeat, to rephrase, to talk slowly, or uh, we really stimulate and we will try to make an effort uh, in order to communicate even if there are some uh, uh, understanding or language barriers. So we are for the inclusion say that uh, there will be some breakout rooms where we invite you, of course, to cooperate, to collaborate, to use active listening, to uh, understand also opinion of other uh, people and to treat everybody with respect. So um, as you can see on the downside of the slide, there is an email. So please, uh, this is not a recorded session. We are here alive. We would like to uh, 
have you totally dedicated to this session. So if you can postpone your work, your related issues to another time, it's really appreciated from us, but please keep your smartphone closed because you maybe use it from other features like Mentimeters, Jamboard, and so on. Say that, and um, about translation, I can tell you that uh, the conversation will go in English, but if you feel more comfortable in expressing in the chat some questions in French or in Spanish, we are happy to uh, look at that. We can understand it, we can uh, translate it for the general audience, and the answer can be provided in English. So if you don't feel comfortable in expressing yourself in English, you can still use French or Spanish, but the answer will be received in English for uh, overall understanding of everybody. So, and in order to do that, so particularly for the French support, I want to introduce you, Erika Hall, that she is one of the presenters. Uh, she is uh, working for World Vision International, and as you can see from the slide, she's a qualified lawyer and advocacy expert with more than 15 years working for NGOs and United Nations on child rights policy and programming in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, CAR, DRC, Rwanda, and Uganda, amongst other countries. So, she is expert on gender-based violence and international criminal law for the UK Government Stabilization Unit and a deployable child protection expert for justice rapid response. As a fun fact, Erika is best known in her office for baking skills. And uh, on her side, I have Christine McCormick that uh, she comes from Save the Children International and she is the Global Child Protection Advisor for Children in Armed Conflict and fragile state at Save the Children, as I said. So with a psychology and social work background, she's ex extensive experience in working on child protection in conflict-affected country, focusing primarily on grave violation on children and adolescents associated with armed force and armed groups, as CAFAG will be referring in the acronyms, family strengthening and mental health support. As well as working for Save the Children, Christine as well has an extensive background in working with UNICEF and other international child rights organizations from the civil society. And within her current job, Christine is also the co-chair of the Paris Principles Steering Committee Group, that is the interagency group supporting advocacy and pol in policy on addressing recruitment and use of children. So as you can understand from the background of these two presenters, the topics will be extremely interesting. We are going to look, first of all, in the first abstract uh, on uh, the general situation and challenges faced by children uh, in armed conflict, uh, considering how COVID-19 tackled uh, so their mental and physical well-being. And uh, after that, we are going to focus uh, a bit more with the second abstract, looking particularly at the experience of uh, children uh, uh, and uh, CAFAX uh, and uh, the use and the recruitment and also a bit the reintegration of CAFAX during uh, COVID-19 pandemics in uh, uh, armed conflict. Say that, I'm going to leave the floor to uh, Erika Hall. Erika, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Don. I have to say, I'm very jealous, Christine, of your photo. I definitely need an updated photo. Um, but anyway, I'll work on that later. Um, so I don't know how many people actually did get around to um, viewing the video that we did and, and that I posted um, on, in the YouTube channel. So just to give you a brief summary. Uh, so sh the idea is to share some of the findings from research World Vision has conducted on the challenges that children who are living in conflict zones face in the midst of an epidemic. Uh, so particularly those linked to protection and their mental health, but really just what was coming out when we spoke, when we've spoken to children uh, about, about what they're facing. So we already know that children who are living in a conflict, uh, in conflict areas face significant challenges for their own protection, education, uh, and wider well-being. Uh, and so when you have the area that is additionally affected by a health epidemic like Ebola or COVID-19, those those 
impacts and the protection risks are exponentially compounded. So the way I like to say is instead of having a one plus one equals two, we have a one plus one equals five. Um, and certainly this is what children have been saying to us. And so we must address these in a holistic way that is sensitive to the, to the conflict, to, to the reality of an armed conflict. So I didn't put any slides because I think that gets a bit boring for all of us. So I'll just talk through quickly a few, a, a few key points that came up from children. So we have some time for discussion. So <clears throat> really looking at the, comparing the previous and current concerns of children and, and how the epidemic has changed these or, or not changed them. Um, children have talked about the loss of things that offer them some sense of stability in their lives. So access to schools, social relationships, family, and the feelings of isolation that are linked to this. Again, this is not um, distinct from, from what we're hearing from other children in other settings. But, but it's, it's a consistent ebbing and flowing of fear that they, and, and the loss and the sense of instability that they have, have felt, many of them throughout most of their lives. Um, so, you know, and particularly the fear of, of losing friends and, and losing loved ones. Um, so they also talk a lot about meeting, the, the meeting their basic needs and, and, and that, how important that is. Uh, but it's interesting when we often talk about, you know, basic needs around food and then education uh, comes up. Uh, sorry, I think there's a message here and I can't tell what I'm doing wrong. What am I doing wrong? Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so we talk a lot about access to food and access to shelter, but what children often say is security. So they talk about security, food and education. Um, with security often coming out first. So this is the order that, that they talk about them. So, so where you have an armed conflict that's already heightening the violence and the exploitation of children, the impacts of the epidemic, so whether it's the economic impacts um, that we're seeing uh, with, with COVID-19, um, as well as sort of the risks of, of being left to fend for themselves, these are, these are heightened and, and this is what their priorities are. Uh, children have also spoken to us about the high levels of psych psychological distress that they're feeling, um, not just because of whether it's Ebola or COVID-19, but also because of the security situation. So <clears throat> this pervasive fear that I heard from a lot of children in the DRC last year, that the militias would return and their families would need to flee once again, which is something they'd faced many times before, and, and really asking how, how can they do that in the midst of an epidemic? So, so recognizing that, that joint, uh, the convergence of, of problems, uh, and really highlighting the insecurity that has become a way of life for them, of insecurity, you know, speaking a lot about armed groups, guns, fear of being forcibly taken from, from their families, um, and, and then enhancing those fears that have already become persistent throughout their lives. So that fear of loss, of death, uh, and of abandonment. So in terms of the four priorities that children um, express to us, uh, one is meeting their basic needs, as I said. Uh, the second is really calling for peace and an end to the epidemic. So the two cannot be seen as as individual because of the, the, the greatest impact they have on them. So even if we're trying to focus on the epidemic, the, the conflict and, and the need for peace is very, very present and real for them. Uh, and then asking for support with their mental well-being uh, came, came out again. This is not things that we have asked them specifically about, but that has come directly from them. Um, and then finally, the, a lot of um, children were specifically asking for there to be awareness raising uh, to end the stigma that is faced by those who have been directly affected by the epidemic and, and the impact that has on, on themselves and their families. So to look at how do we then embed a conflict sensitive approach to child protection during an epidemic. For me, the, the key takeaway here is that in responding to any epidemic, 
um, we need to address the specific considerations in conflict prone zones, rather than a generic response that might work in another part of the same country. And have an adaptable approach to programming to embed the specific needs of, of children who are living in those contexts. So this includes creating the space for children in conflict settings to articulate what their fears and concerns are in, in the face of this additional uh, crisis. Um, obviously, it has to be done safely. But again, it, it, children are the ones who know what, what they're feeling and, and, and sort of what their main concerns are. Uh, and secondly, is, is advocating and advocating for and embedding a protection sensitive response, which I know is something we're, we're, we're all uh, uh, in, in favor of. So preaching a bit to the converted, but ensuring that having uh, creating a strong protective environment for children to to be tackling the root causes of this unhealthy stress uh, and the violence and, and provide them with support. Um, and, and then to ensure existing work to support children in conflict settings does not stop. Christine is going to speak specifically about children who are associated with armed forces and armed groups. But I think generally we've, we've seen in an epidemic that a lot of these other programs get put to the, to the side uh, and, and that's a real danger uh, for children. And then if I can, can do my little plug for the um, the child protection minimum standards, uh, pillar four standards to work across sectors. Um, so <coughs> again, we should be both trying to use these and then advocating uh, with donors and, and with the international community around embedding those. So that's, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Erica, particularly and specifically for the the quote to the CPMS. Indeed, uh, it's one year from the anniversary and it's always uh, useful uh, to remember that uh, there is, uh, there are tools uh, and standards who can help us to ensure that children are protected in the best way. And also we have to remember that uh, minimum standard is not uh, something that we need uh, to achieve because as, a, as we say, they are the minimum standard that we have to guarantee is an obligation that we have in providing humanitarian assistance. So ensuring that quality is not compromised when we serve our community, when we serve our children. So now uh, I would like to link it to what Erica said to uh, share some slide with some questions about uh, her presentation. And we would like to ask uh, uh, you participants, uh, audience, to uh, join us in uh, responding through the Zoom chat. So um, we have two questions so that it can help us to, um, in a sort of way, tailor a bit and understand uh, also which experience and context you have been. So first of all, the first question that we would like to see the answer is like, what surprised you in the priority identified by children in what they say or didn't say? We know that uh, the meaningful child participation is one of the child protection principles. So if you have been consulting children, if you have conducted even during COVID in armed uh, conflict, some uh, um, focus group discussions, some KII, if you have been asked with them. So what they told you, what they, what they say to you, what you have been surprised in their priority, what is their priority? So you can answer in the chat. What is the most urgent need? Responses were not health related. Oh, oh, I saw Erica <laughs> so having a reaction, yeah. So what was the most urgent need of children? Let's see if it's some something coming in the chat. We can answer. In Somalia, children expressed 
fear of missing out on national exams. You can, or if you don't want to put it in the chat, you can also uh, open your mic and talk. Eh? So, no discussion of movement restriction, Brigitte. Thank you. I can add also something from uh, experiences in Bangladesh where uh, uh, in Cox Bazar, children were afraid of being kidnapped because they perceived the COVID as a, a way that where someone would come and put them away from the family through to isolation uh, in case they would find the separated and uh, they use like kidnapped. So, well, the awareness and the end stigma on epidemic effect was somehow related to health. Marcello Viola, thank you. Who does an urgent need mental health concern always come up? So, well, I don't know. I would like to uh, leave the setting to the second answer, so the second question, and maybe Erica, if you're happy after to unpack a bit more on that. So if you can move the slide. Second question for you, what does taking a conflict sensitive approach to child protection during an epidemic mean to you? When we are talking about uh, a conflict sensitive approach during an epidemic response, what does this mean to you? That's the moment where you can add more from you, where you can also uh, ask any other questions. And uh, uh, while you can and continue to answer in the chat box, I let the floor to Erika to unpack a bit. Erika, if you want to add. Sorry, I had muted myself. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think a, um, so I'm kind of scrolling back up, uh, but Mar uh, Marco raised a, an interesting point about um, we're the ones designing the question. So, so is, that, um, is that actually having an impact on, on what comes out? So, so I think that, you know, that's absolutely uh, a concern and an and, and issue. And the research that World Vision is doing at the moment, um, we have been back and forth on that and, and, and certainly have tried to try out the questions first to, to make sure we're, we aren't tailoring it that way. In the DRC, when I, uh, when I did this last year in the Ebola response, um, actually the questions were very generic. Um, so, so we were not asking them about specific things. We were not asking them about education or protection, or it was asking them what they, um, you know, what their sort of day-to-day -day life was like before uh, Ebola and, and then what it was like now. Uh, during Ebola, what their um, hopes were, what their what their fears were, what what they felt the what they felt the priorities were. So we were very much trying to keep it very open to see what they would come out with, um, and and so I think that that was um, I think that that was definitely a consideration, but we were certainly trying uh, trying to do trying to do that. Um, and, and obviously, it's always, it's always an issue. Um, Bridget's asking about uh, any, any distinctions we found between boys, uh, boys and girls. Uh, in terms of, the, of the, uh, the sort of burdens on them and, and what they, they were, you know, girls obviously were having more, uh, as we know, often have more of that caregiving in the household. And, and so those burdens that were placed on them if a family member was ill. Um, but they were still saying the same, you know, it was saying the same thing. We want to be able to go to school. We want to get an education. We want to feel safe. So, so while there are distinctions in, in maybe what made them feel unsafe, um, where sexual violence came up much more strongly um, for girls, whereas um, uh, being uh, sort of being abducted, recruited came up more strongly for, for boys. Um, there, there was still that same, uh, that, that same feeling. 
in terms of what they felt and, and the isolation they felt and, and some of the loss they felt, it was very much, um, it was very much the same. And, and, you know, we did, we did make sure we had a wide range of ages and that we had equal numbers uh, of boys and girls and trying to get them from, from as, as, as wide a, a spectrum as possible. But obviously with any, any research, um, <laughs> there are limitations on it. Um, and, and I think there, there, it's interesting that there, so the responses were not health related. I mean, there were some in terms of that fear of, of going to a hospital, but it was, it was more of a fear of if my, you know, if a family member goes, will they come back? Um, and I think that was, that, that was what really came up that, again, you know, you're talking to a specific group of, I think in DRC, we had 350 children we spoke to. So, you know, you can't say it represents the entire community. Um, and I think that the, the movement restrictions came up in the sense of that feeling of isolation and of not being able to, um, to, to continue their day-to-day -day activities. But, but there was a link there with the insecurity over, um, you know, how, and I'm not sure how to explain it, but, but that real sense of how do we, um, how, how can we feel safe in our home and staying in one place when we know that there are armed groups sort of coming and going, which was the reality um, at that time. Well, I would say that uh, thank you, Erika, for accompanying uh, all of us uh, to the um, to the next abstract. I saw that uh, Layal and Sole uh, has both raised their hands to speak. So for that reason, if uh, you want, you can uh, add a bit. Uh, the floor is uh, to Maria Sole Fanuzzi. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Domia. Even though I think Layal was before me, but <laughs> Layal, I'll keep uh, it's just a question. Um, does Erika, thanks a lot for the presentation. Do you have the feeling that in the data collection um, of this paper, did you did the element of agency change a little bit the analysis or maybe the findings? I think that sometimes um, when we talk about recruitment of children. Uh, you know, the, like the worst case scenario is for children who have been kidnapped and so not voluntarily join the armed groups or armed forces. And how does it change the sort of voluntary recruitment, um, you know, the agency element in analyzing the priorities that they expressed at the end, like, you know, uh, just even in terms of safety, peace and security, etc. So just very quick. Thanks a lot. Okay, if you want, Erika, we can hear also the question of Layal and you can address them both. Sure. Yeah. It wasn't a, mine wasn't a question. I was just going to comment on um, some of the, the comments in the chat about the children not responding on health and how I don't think that that's the question so much as just because we ask about health, it doesn't mean that's what, you know, children are going to respond about life and their yeah. answers are very reflective of their lives. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that really connects to, and this is just what I want to say, to some discussions we're having later this week about the centrality of child protection and in infectious disease responses and how when we think of infectious disease responses, COVID now, but future pandemics later, um, we really need to think beyond, okay, what is the health response and the health implications and how does that affect children and families, but rather how does the health situation affect the protection situation, the education situation, and all of that trickle down to the well-being of children. So I think these are really good comments and the people will hopefully be able to carry that forward to the discussions tomorrow, I think they are. Thank you, Ayan. So the floor is uh, to Erika. Excellent comments, um, Leo. Thank you very much, as always. Um, it, just to answer quickly on the question about voluntary recruitment, again, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that came up in that sense. Um, so Christine probably um, can address that that much more in depth in in her presentation, which focuses specifically on children who are associated with. Uh, CAFAC, children associated with armed forces and groups. Yeah, and I think that uh, Etika, really um, thank you for accompanying us for, uh, go, uh, for going on a deeper level. So I would like to 
let the floor to Christine who can add more on the conversation. And I want to ensure to participants that after, in the second part, after this uh, break, because in 10 minutes we are having a break, after the presentation of Christine Abstract, we are still going to have uh, a conversation all together where you can uh, uh, contribute more. So Christine, the floor is yours, uh, guide us in, the, uh, in this nice voyage. Great, thanks very much. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, I'm, I'm struck by, you know, the, the close complementarity in what uh, Erica has been talking about and, and this sort of slightly sort of more focused look on, on CAFAG. Um, plus also thinking that it's not so long ago that there were two, um, the Alliance um, supported two webinars, uh, one in English, one in French, looking at this issue as well. Um, so I think there, Erica has also recognised there are a lot of issues here that are very familiar to us. And I'm, you know, seeing this as an opportunity where we can have a, you know, another um, sort of close look at, at the situation and, and what we need to be um, sort of focusing on, um, particularly in our programming, but also recognising some of the advocacy that is also going on and, and that's needed. Um, so we're very aware of sort of the, the high levels of, of recruitment that were going on and that was reported um, prior to to the uh, pandemic and just thinking that sort of in the in the 2020 uh, annual report from the Secretary General on children armed conflict, um, approximately a third of the, the reported or verified um, uh, grave violations uh, were recruitment and use. And what we've seen in from certainly from um, my colleagues um, at Save the Children, um, recognizing that um, despite things like the, the call for a global ceasefire, recruitment is, is going on. And in, you know, we've had colleagues in, in DRCs um, commenting on the fact that they're seeing an increase and, and that's um, being recognized within, um, with, with child protection actors. Um, in particular in, in Colombia, uh, there's been quite a number of reports of quite a high level of, of recruitment uh, going on. Um, I think um, in one um, UNHCR report that considered to be a sort of fivefold um, increase in, in recruitment. Um, a lot of the, the reasons uh, for this, I think, have been highlighted in, um, in what Erica has been talking about, thinking of the socioeconomic impact of, of COVID. So that even just after sort of six months of, of the pandemic, we are seeing, we've seen um, an impact on, on the protection of, of children, plus recognition that, you know, that we've still got conflict going on within, a, within the pandemic and um, we need to be sort of focusing on those pre-existing um, sort of threats and, and situation of, of children um, in addition to, to addressing uh, COVID. Um, what we've also seen come up is, again, as, as has been highlighted, um, sort of heightened psychological distress. Um, children in, in places like South Sudan, um, considering that, or reporting that, um, yes, they've been, been released, but they're very scared about going home uh, for a number of factors. They don't feel that the um, their home environment is, is safe for them um, and really, would they be better off um, staying within armed armed groups? Um, we've seen, and I know this was discussed in the in the webinars, the fact that certainly initially in, in some countries, planned um, releases of children were halted, um, and in some cases, we've been able to see some children coming out, um, but um, there are a lot of children who who need to be released. Um, um, but the processes uh, for that have been stored or have been paused. We're needing to look at um, the conditions to support release um, and what is needed um, to do that, not just in the actual release process, but the services and supports that are required um, for that. Um, we've seen um, very much sort of concerns around and, and challenges in provision of, of services. Um, and I know a lot of you on um, listening to this will be very familiar to 
we need to really think about how can we be doing uh, case management work how can we be providing the same level of psychological or psychosocial support to children coming out plus also children whose protecting environment uh, protective environment um, noting the impact of COVID and conflict um, how can we continue to provide that that support um, again I'm going to say um, as, as Erica said one of the other big uh, challenges that we have have found is either the diversion of, of funding and resources or just sort of the lack of funding uh, for child protection essential child protection um, in programming particularly in uh, conflict affected areas and that's had a real impact on how much we're able to continue the existing support that we particularly reintegration support that we can provide children but very much one thing that's been highlighted within Save the Children is is the need for um, looking at prevention of recruitment um, so how can we address these challenges and and I think the uh, the webinars that we had a, you know, a few weeks ago um, were great in highlighting a lot of the work that agencies have have done particularly at a community level in trying to continue providing particularly reintegration support um, i think what's come up for us within save the children i think it's sort of it's noting about three three key things um, really having a closer look and, and recognition of the multiple shocks uh, that children in, in conflict affected countries are, are facing um, as Her Erica has sort of highlighted before um, you know what has what has their situation and their environment been in relation to conflict prior to um, to the pandemic thinking about the additional stresses that have um, added to that, um, the vulnerabilities to, to prevent, to, to recruitment, particularly with the, the lack of schools and other protective environments um, that, um, because they've been closed due to restrictions. Um, as I said before, the socioeconomic impact um, and, and the high, you know, higher risk of recruitment because of that. Um, what has been discussed within Save the Children has really been, you know, how can we continue to monitor and report um, on grave violations? Um, and I've seen, certainly for myself, an, in, an uptake in interest uh, or sort of recognition of that with a number of our country offices, um, focusing on, you know, how can they improve, how can they strengthen their existing uh, monitoring reporting in relation to grave violations how can they be sort of recognizing the connection between that and uh, monitoring that has been increased within communities looking at a broader range of protection concerns importantly how can we um, the importance of the multi-sectoral responses um, and the centrality of, of protection so it's not just you know within our our child protection programming, our um, education programming, thinking about the, the big push on the safe back to school, safe back to education, back to learning initiatives that are going on. How can we be looking at those in relation to children who were already vulnerable to recruitment, um, but also may those children whose vulnerability has increased because of, of COVID. So having a very much sort of inclusive um, sort of focus on that. Um, what's also been very important for us has been advocacy. This came out very strongly also in, in, the, in the webinars a few weeks ago. Um, there's, within Save the Children we've had a number of conversations around sort of how can we demonstrate the importance to states of their legal responsibilities, their pre-existing responsibilities to protect children in, in conflict. Um, and making that more, more broadly, sort of really looking at the resourcing that is required. Um, it's great that we've seen sort of that recognized by a number of, of donors, um, but feeling that sort of as either sort of two donors or even within our own organizations potentially um, when there is um, potentially a, 
a reduction of resourcing because of, of the overall, the global impact, economic impact of, of COVID. How can we be making sure that um, the resourcing and the funding for humanitarian um, uh, interventions in conflict affected countries have the correct focus on, on child protection. How can we be embedding child protection within our, our other uh, sec sectoral um, responses as, as well and looking at the sort of the key linkages, particularly with education, particularly with social protection. Um, there's been a lot of focus on, on cash programming. Um, how are we able to sort of look at that from the perspective of prevention, particularly of, of recruitment, but also some of the other protection concerns, noting what um, Erica was saying as, as well. Um, how can we um, encourage, um, again, and, and view some of the, the community-based uh, work that we're doing, the engagement with community leaders? Um, and it was interesting, just wanted to, to note some experience from, from UNICEF and their local partners in, in the Philippines. They, they shared this within, with the sorry, within the recent webinar of engagement with local religious leaders. Um, and I know that this has been very much um, considered within the, the RCCE work um, that many agencies have been engaging with in, in their COVID responses. How can we take sort of the opportunity of, of that communication engagement work to so also think, how can we start engaging more? How can we be continuing to engage with, with religious leaders, with communities, et cetera, on sort of uh, protection concerns within a, a conflict environment? Um, how can, you know, religious leaders, if they're having these child protection sermons, as, as our colleagues from the Philippines mm -hmm. refer to them as, which, which made me smile. Um, how can we sort of ensure that not only are we looking at the sort of concerns on, on COVID, but reiterating and, and making sure that the concerns and, and the risks from, from conflict um, are also addressed well, and included in that. And I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, Christina, you added incredible seeds that I would like participants to reflect uh, during this uh, small break of five minutes that we are taking on. Really, this question can help us to reflect a bit, and I will encourage you to uh, take these five minutes to uh, think, because uh, we really need your contribution, because in the second part we are going to have a focus group discussion on all these questions that has been raised, and uh, we really welcome uh, uh, participation from the audience on adding on top on the topic and provide maybe some answer to the question posed by Erica and Christine. So it's 5.05, let's come back at the, uh, three, uh, sorry, at 4.10. Uh, you can close your mic, close your uh, camera, and see you back in five minutes for uh, going deeper and having our focus group discussion all together. Thank you. The, I think that the link gives us a sec uh, the same question. Ah, no, okay, what are, uh, yes, what area of child protection in conflict are you focusing on? So, let's see the results. What area of child protection and conflict are you focusing on? When we, when we say area, it can be like uh, a cross-cutting issues. It can be like uh, a specific topics. It can be a specific programs like case management. Okay, so we see CP in general, uh, donor, CAFAX, uh, child labor and child early forced marriage, uh, child protection emergency and uh, children and armed conflict. Uh, the worst form of child labor, the gender dimension of conflict for children, unaccompanied and severed children. That is really interesting. How conflict impacts upon children different based on aspect of diversity, grave violation against children, UN, CAC agenda. So, displaced children, WASC, MHPSS, GBV. That's great. So sexual violence, detention, I think that detention was also something that uh, could be uh, discussed later. 
So children detention and reintegration of CAFAGs, uh, um, I will not anticipate. So, and then thank you for all of that. And I think we have the third one, right? We have a third question. So, third vote for you guys. Thank you for joining so actively with all these answers. You are giving us a lot of elements to work together. Third question is, which conflict affected countries do you have experience working in on? So give a name of, of the country where you have been working on that has been affected by conflict. see what's coming out oh -ho. South Sudan Iraq Syria Nigeria Lebanon Afghanistan Somalia Mali Yemen Burkina Faso Palestine Niger DRC Sudan and Central African Republic so considering that the word cloud is going on dimension I think that we have multiple entries for South Sudan, Syria, and Iraq. Let's see if South Sudan is still one of the top entered. So Iraq follow, that is Cote d'Ivoire, not, not East Nigeria specifically. So Burkina Faso, DRC, Lebanon entered, Mali. Okay, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Nigeria comes, Niger, Colombia, Syria regional response, yes, Syria, Iraq, South Sudan, DRC, Nigeria, Somalia. I think that we have a great uh, overview of uh, uh, many, uh, conflict man-made uh, uh, emergency so we saw that now the entrance uh, the, of the participants change a bit the uh, the level of priority but still south sudan syria iraq and nigeria looks to be the main one so um, now let's move on on the next bit thank you now we go back on the Zoom, there is no uh, need of external application. I would like uh, only Max, if you can share the screen with the, the two questions related to the abstract of Christine's that we would like to unpack you, uh, unpack with you in the chat. So we have, uh, um, let's, this was about, uh, uh, can you identify two factors that can lead to increased recruitment of boys and girls due to the pandemic? Yes, Marco, uh, the idea that we wanted to use uh, uh, the Mentimeter is because we wanted in a sort of way give uh, uh, an overview about uh, the, uh, the context that we are working, hoping for experience coming from all the participants on this in order to help us to frame a bit what is the rationale behind some comments and the experience that we can use in the chat. So uh, it was more in order to assess and to bring everybody on a more awareness about the uh, opportunity of comments that we can have from this uh, uh, conversation that is going to follow, particularly looking at uh, uh, the different context. So, you're welcome, Marco. So again, now, since the chat is going on with the active participants, please, if you have two factors that can lead to increased recruitment of boys and girls to the pandemic, as you saw, we have many different uh, experience from many different countries and crises. Uh, please, uh, sharing is caring. So school closure, economic fallout of pandemic. So leading to lack of food, livelihood, extreme poverty, financial deprivation. So, 
skull closure comes back, yes. Lack of access to regular child protection risk. One of the keys that mostly came out from one, some of experience in case management with former CAFAGs in programs that uh, it happens uh, for me to, to read and to work with, uh, uh, there was an extremely interesting percentages of uh, children reporting to uh, recruitment as a CAFAG, leading as a reason having a vulnerable caregiver. So the role of breadwinner uh, stimulates them to find a means of survivors. So increased activities of armed group, so forced recruitment. So thank you. And then Max, can we move to the next question? Can you tell us how would you address this factor? So any lesson learned, good practice that you can put in the chat uh, about that. So, I, I mean, we are not looking for solution, but if you have any, something to put in the chat, because I'm now leaving the floor to Eric and Christine, because we can try to answer to these questions or comment together. So um, prioritize FSL, livelihood intervention, integrated cash transfer for well-being. This is something that provides social protection support to family, maintain continuity of service. So uh, I think that I saw Eric and Christine ready to go deeper in the conversation. So I quit talking and the stage is yours, Eric and Christine, if you want to guide us deeper on this uh, answers. Eric and Christine, if you want. Okay. The um, yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Sorry, I was just trying to um, unmute myself. Um, just noting the um, responses in, in the chat box, um, there's a, a strong focus on, on social protection. Um, and in a way, I have a, a question for, for colleagues. Um, are we seeing the opportunity um, in the um, sort of funding uh, that's coming through, the, the opportunities from donors or, or within our programming it, itself to include focus um, in our um, economic or our, our social protection and FSL programming um, is, Yes, I'll leave it as that, that question. Are, are we seeing the opportunities to, to integrate child protection, to have this focus in our, on our programming? Um, and so that was one one question to to ask. Um, another thing that I wanted to to also um, look at, um, and we were talking about um, case management services, for example, um, was sort of how are we able to prioritize um, the most vulnerable cases? Um, a lot has been said around you know, how we can adapt our, our case management work um, to provide support um, over the phone. Um, and this is obviously very important. Um, what have we seen, though, in, in that ad adaptation to, um, to recognise that with some, some families, with some, some children, we may still need to do face-to-face -face, um, uh, support um, are we able to do that within the the restrictions um, of social distancing movement etc are our own processes within our own organizations allowing that um, and recognizing also the need that um, you know we may have a, a, a set sort of schedule um, for for visits for follow-up for for engagement with, with with work with with individual families and and children um one of the things that we've been considering is given the additional um strains uh, and and challenges because of, of covid how are we able to increase that contact 
um, whether it's from um, parasocial workers or case workers, how are we being able to consider that within the, the community networks that we, we've got? Um, so I'm interested uh, to hear or, or to read in the chat box what other people's um, uh, experiences of that has, has been. Um, Another thing that we've also been considering um, in in some of our community um, based work is with with all the sort of increased focus of an and need to rely on community structures far more um, how and the increase in in using them um, what considerations have we had in um, ensuring that they are able to, to do that work, given the environments that they're working in, thinking about sort of the security situation, um, some of the very sensitive issues that they uh, would be sort of identifying um, and, and seeing within communities or hearing from, from children um, around the risks, particularly for recruitment, but also perhaps other other grave violations. Um, how have we been able to put in place the supports for community um, groups, community members, to enable them to continue to do that in, in a safe environment? Um, I'm finding within Save the Children, there's a far more conversation uh, and discussion around sort of, you know, looking at, at risk, uh, risk assessments to support um monitoring um and monitoring reporting going on within um the environment of, of conflict and and covid can i say that layal raised the hands so yep. if she wants yes certainly I was... thank you i actually i'm going to take you back to your first question um certainly. which i think was and i was just i was writing it down which is why i didn't get to you fast enough but what are the opportunities there are to um, and, and I think the topic was integrating child protection and, and specifically preventing recruitment within social protection programs. Um, and I actually want to ask sort of a clarification or spin it differently for everyone, but opportunities, do we mean like, uh, are we going back to the idea of uh, opportunities with donors and the funding that's being either redirected from protection to health or just not being given to protection to begin with, or opportunities um, you know, uh, secondly, would be to actually connect with colleagues who are establishing the social protection system. So a lot of social protection, social policy and humanitarian cash colleagues across the organizations. And is the, you know, is the challenge actually getting child protection inserted into those programs and having, um, you know, potential like vulnerability of households, whether on an economic scale or, you know, having uh, children who are at risk of recruitment be included as an identified vulnerability for children, for households to receive um, inclusion or uh, in those programs. I'm just wondering, you know, what, uh, where we're seeing more of those blockages. Um, and I'll put this out there. I'm asking in part as I have a conversation with donors coming up later this week to summarize some of the meetings. So any thing like this that um, that people would like to flag is very useful because I can then, in addition to saying these are my ideas, um, carry it forward. So if people want to flag anything um, around that, uh, I'd be interested to hear perspectives. Well, just to add to that, I feel that both are, are necessary. I, I feel that, um, you know, a lot of agencies um, are finding the need to um, sort of the opportunities and and to to a degree a, an element of internal advocacy to make sure that child protection is included in in other um, sectors. So this sort of centrality of protection that has come up in in what people have, have said, um, but also sort of highlighting that and demonstrating that to to donors as as well. And what do we need to be saying to to donors to say, look, you know child protection is is life-saving I think that if I can add and maybe I may I may risk to be unpopular uh, I, I agree in mainstreaming on protection I agree in looking at the uh, integration uh, of uh, child protection with other uh, livelihood or I see like uh, economic uh, opportunities 
I think that what we really need a cultural change is that uh, we do not need more to advocate for child protection because everybody agrees that child protection is important. We need to advocate for uh, funds to be allocated to child protection because we we know that uh, what is one of the uh, common uh, comment of donors is that child protection programs are expenses because with one kids worker you can support only 25 children while with a, mm -hmm. a tot budget you can distribute tons of uh, hygiene kits uh, under wash so for that reason uh, they perceive that in terms of visibility in terms of uh, how much we can reach uh, so the cost for uh, supporting uh, in terms of funding uh, uh, children associated with armed force in their reintegration in the community, the cost for preventing uh, recruitment are extremely high in terms of results because what we need is really strengthening evidence. I'm so glad to see all these comments and lessons learned coming from the chat because they can really strengthen the evidence about what is being mm -hmm. achieved. So. I don't want to use the slogans like every life matters, but that is the point. I mean, uh, one uh, children associated with armed force who come back and face reintegration issues and face stigma, how it's our sense of obligation to be accompanied them. And uh, yet, of course, uh, I see that uh, uh, indeed we cannot do all of this only alone. The, Pillar four of the CPMS uh, mm -hmm. teach us that integration with livelihood, with nutrition, with uh, other things uh, are uh, extremely important. But what we really need uh, is uh, moving away from advocating for child protection. And uh, uh, what also the guidance pr produced, I think, last year, unprotected about how much fund mm -hmm. is not going destined to child protection, even if the evidence are there. Something that we really need to change this culture. So. Mm. Wait, can, can we I really yeah. have values in, uh, in the donor. Sorry, I just yeah, wanted to add. add I, go, I move to go. That's okay. Uh, I just wanted to add add one point and and really think back to those of us who were at the uh, annual meeting last year, which focused on the nexus, child protection in the nexus, and and I think that's an issue that again it's sort of became a big popular thing and and now. Uh, strangely, it seems to have fallen by the wayside, where actually a global pandemic like this is, is really an example of what happens when you are not looking at these issues across yeah. the nexus. So, so I think, you know, maybe now is the time to be getting that more into people's minds, that child protection is, is not just life-saving now, but it's that, you know, you've got to strengthen uh, I think Bridget was making a comment about uh, about strengthening um, about what we need to do for community protection uh, mechanisms, and and others have made that comment as well. And and I think that that that's something that we still seem to have a struggle at getting across. And I don't know if it's the way we're framing it, the language we're using, which is understand. You know, like we all understand it working together but once we try and get that out to donors and and even more widely in our organizations it sometimes gets a bit lost mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, so thank you Erika, for uh, adding these uh, comments that generates a lot of agreement i see also from maria sole and uh, maria sole and susanna raised their hand so uh, let's give the, the stage to the audience. So, Susanna, would you like to open your mic? Can I actually give it to Maria Soleb uh, first? Because I know her hand is up before mine. Ah, sure. Sorry, I always bet that not that. So, <laughs> no. Maria, sorry, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> no worry, I'm happy. Thanks, Susanna. Thanks, Domenico. Um, I was just, I don't have an answer to the very important question of Layal, but I would like to add um, a layer of complexity and maybe hear from the other participants to the call. Um, one of the needs, for example, that I am facing in this moment in my current duty station, uh, which is Syria, is um, the, the need for linkages and clear guidance 
on um, the you know the formal how the formal sector works and how we need to interact with the formal sectors um, for for example for CAFAC programming considering that one of the biggest uh, challenge that we have in even it is even talking about CAFAG is even a challenge, you know, so access and not just access, physical access or infrastructural access or security access, even access to the language, you know, being able to talk about CAFAG is not always a guarantee. Um, and in some contexts, there's no cluster system, there's no interagency mechanism, not at all. So maybe one thing that we could advocate for, I don't know if it's uh, something that you can take up, Layal, but um, it's uh, basically, you know, if we can provide a coverage for at least interagency mechanism or for the negotiations of a minimum framework for operational environment, you know, for humanitarian agencies by the side of donors, like big donors, institutional donors that could interact with local local stakeholders and sort of like, you know, say, listen, to deliver humanitarian assistance, you barely, at minimum, you need to guarantee this minimum access, you know, because in this moment, in some context, it's not guaranteed. Over to you. Thank you, Sole. Stage uh, floor to Susanna. Thanks very much, Domenico. And um, I've been, I came to the session a little bit late, but I've been uh, really interested to follow the conversations. Um, I think I just a, a very short comment um, linked to um, the discussion you were having about kind of multi sectoral responses and um, the comment um, from Amy from World Vision in uh, in the chat box. I think um, certainly certainly related to Kafag, but also just more broadly to child protection. I think when we're um, asking colleagues when we're kind of advocating with colleagues from other sectors um, to be integrating child protection risks and concerns into how they design and deliver their programming i think it needs to be framed in the sense of you know if you are not doing this your programming is not going to be effective you're not going to achieve your sectoral outcomes and there's actually a fair amount of research um, behind this of nutrition programming integrated with child protection being actually more effective at achieving nutritional outcomes for children um, so it's not it's not a favor they're doing to, for us it's um, it's about achieving higher quality program and better outcomes for children um, and i would just say kind of similarly like um, when we're making the the case to donors and and maybe in response to kind of Lyle's question, it's um, and and a bit the point that Erica was making about kind of going back to the nexus. I think sometimes we need to borrow um, some of the the language and the research from our development colleagues who really focus on the research behind adverse childhood experiences um, and recover, recovering from ACEs and the fact that it's actually a massive cost to society if you don't support children's recovery. Um, and there's a huge argument for that with CAFAG that actually you're saving money if you invest in uh, CAFAG reintegration and support right now. Um, and that's that's a huge case for donors. And I think we just need to get better at us as, as, as a sector at articulating that, that Yes, our, our programs are expensive because we're saving you 10 times that much down the line. Um, and I just think that's a, that's a really important uh, that we're, we're by investing in a child now and investing in their recovery, we're saving you all of the societal problems and links to links to um, kind of greater societal breakdown if we don't do that now. So, first of all, thank you, Susanna. You generate uh, <laughs> tons of comments as well in the chat. I want to tell that uh, also thank you, Amy Gabriel from World Vision, so for her comments. Uh, it's true that sometimes we do not com have to commit the mistakes of only looking at what are our needs as a child protection sector, but also look at what are the necessities of other sector when we're talking particularly on in integrating approach, not only on mainstreaming. So, so I feel that there are too many questions in this uh, uh, chat and I don't know from where to take more. Uh, there are extreme linkages. Uh, um, there is a question for you, Suzanne, in the chat about data around that. Uh, and yes, so, Christine, Erica, would you like to have some 
closing remarks because in uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, the session will uh, reach to an end but I want to ensure that uh, you can uh, add uh, everything you needed uh, for the for the, our participants. Erica, do, would you like to go first? So you had the first um, presentation. Sure, sorry, yes, I somehow managed to minimize the screen and I couldn't get it back up again. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, unfortunately, at these kinds of events, what we need is more time to discuss together. Um, and I'm glad that we did get some, uh, some time for that. And a couple of things that really stood out for me is one, how are we doing the research on, um, on, on, on the impacts of whatever it is on children? Um, and how do we do it in a way that we're not biasing the results um, by the questions themselves, um, but in a way that does not make the research so unmanageable. When you, are, when you ask open-ended questions, doing the analysis of that can, uh, can be quite time consuming. So, you know, can we invest in that and can we, can we invest in more um, you know, research where children themselves are identifying and defining the questions. Um, and then I think this, this bigger point of how do we, how do we em embed um, not just trying to get child protection higher on the agenda in, in a, an epidemic response, um, but, but the making that case for you know, it's actually, you know, as Susanna said, and others said, it's, it's really about how you, uh, the, the positive impact it has on everything else that, that we're trying to do as organizations and as, sec as other sectors. So, so we need to push that and we need to have as much data behind that. Um, because I know the costing is, is an issue. If we can say, if you invest X amount of money, you get a tenfold um, it saves you 10 times that in the long run, that's, you know, that's something donors, donors and even organizations but, uh, will listen to. Um, but for me, it, it, there's also this question that, that I constantly uh, am struggling with a bit in terms of how do we um, have, it, you know, having that protective environment for children and having that formal and informal protection system um, you know, and all of the actors in that, the children, the families, the communities, and, and the, the, you know, wider structures. Um, how, how do we make that understandable to people who are not working in, in our sector? Because I, I, I do feel like we still, you know, it's, it, to me, that's a, a, a no-brainer across the nexus. If we can strengthen those, those systems, even the in, informal, I'm not talking just about the formal system, then when something like this happens, you, you have a, 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 a more protective environment for children. Thanks. Christine, if you want to add. Um, thanks. Um, I mean, I agree with, with all of these, these points. Um, I would add to that, um, we've talked about sort of how do we work with others, how do we get other people to understand what we what we need. Um, I think I would add to that, um, you know, how can we ensure that just within child protection, how are we ensuring that we've got a conflict or a children armed conflict um, lens within the work that we, we do? Um, I think it, you know, there's been a huge upscale in, in looking at how we're doing sort of common programming across all our, our our work you know in many many countries um and that's been brilliant to, to see i think you know we there is still um what what i'd like to sort of hear more of is is how we are you know looking not only at the impact of, of covid but also the impact of of conflict within our, our programming as well because i think there is um a great sort of tendency and an, in a way and an understandable tendency for people to say this is the you know the latest crisis we need to be really focusing on on this um, and you know it's come out you know, strongly in, in this discussion but also thinking 
um, you know, with some of the the webinars that have that the alliance has has put together, particularly the the one on, on CAFAG, is you know we still really need to have that focus on on conflict in in relevant countries as as well. So it's that sort of how are we supporting uh, children and, and families communities who've who've had this sort of double um, shock um, threat sort of um, and, and multiple um, sort of threats because of um, conflict as well as, as COVID. So just to add that to the, the great points that Erica made, thanks. Well, and before closing, let me tell that the usual suspect, Layal, Suzanne and Maria Sole raised their hands. So Oh, one oh, no, by one. Sorry. No, no, no. I have to apologize. That was the, the hand from before. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, me, so then. Me too. Young. Sorry. Ah, okay, Susanna, no, for a moment I suppose that it came back the trio. So then, Layal, would you like to add? Mine was a new hand, but I'm very willing to like give the last comment to someone else <laughs> if anyone wants it. No, please, you can no, go. I mean, I was just going to say from what Christine was saying that like I think. It's a shift of thinking, and, and Christine, you laid it out really well, that like we have to think of how we layer responses, right? It's not like, oh, we're in development, health emergency comes, like move one aside, and then health emergency comes, and then it settles down. Or in our case, we're in conflict settings, the health emergency comes, everyone focuses on this. We're not, I think, I mean, and this is not child protection specific, good at actually like thinking how do we combine the intersection of all these things together as opposed to how do we do the conflict piece and then how do we do the health piece and then how do we hope that somehow those magically like mingle together and the very real effects of them overlapping in life somehow trickles down to our responses um, and I think that's the piece that we need to get better at um, in addition to the prevention piece where I think the conversation we'll have later but there's a lot of linkages to the prevention work that the alliance is doing that we can pull out here especially around the data and kind of trying to make that case better, that we're better off preventing than responding, in particular, how expensive our responses are and how relatively inexpensive our prevention work is. Um, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you all. So uh, I'm sorry to wrap up, uh, but particularly because uh, uh, we were having a really incredible conversation and I think that this uh, is uh, an incredibly value and an achievement made by the whole group so thank you to the presenters to the contributors to the participants and to Max for facilitating with the slides so what I would like to express is just uh, my feelings that we will come out of this thematic session with more questions than answer exactly because uh, there has been an incredibly high level dialogue and interaction and plurality I take home in my backpack about these sessions the invaluable comment about how many of us uh, as a child protection community recognize the needs uh, of working with CAFACs and how the economic uh, issues, uh, how the child labor coming back. And I want to remember, to remind all of you that next year, 20, uh, 2021 will be the international year for the elimination of child labor, the worst form of child labor. So. Uh, what I would really encourage is really like, let's start to strengthen evidence to work with uh, children in armed conflict, exactly because uh, uh, our next step forward is really looking at child protection integrating with other sector. I'm not here to highlight again how all this integration and mainstreaming constitute the fourth pillar of the child protection minimum standards. So really now say that, uh, I have an announcement that Max gently put it also in the chat. So I really thank you for joining this chat, this conversation. Now you will have a 10 minutes break and not five. In this way, you can have uh, to step away from this conversation, decompress a bit, take uh, a cup of tea, a coffee, or just relax and decide what will be the next session that you want to join. In order to do that, whatever you have to do is just to leave this uh, uh, conversation, leave these meetings, go back to the Kiku chat and you can select the next session. I really hope that this session was uh, useful and interesting for all of you. If it was, uh, let's remember that this was recorded and it will be shared and put it on uh, the Alliance uh, uh, pages so you can share it and cascade the learning outcomes to other participants or other people in your organization who could not join the session. Remember that sharing is caring. If uh, 
these topics were in useful, you can uh, cascade it. If you think that has not been useful, please don't share it and don't tell to anyone. <laughs> so, no, but uh, I am pretty sure that uh, it was uh, interesting, uh, a lot of mind-blowing fact, uh, and uh, really, thank you, thank you all. So, uh, that's all from our side, and uh, enjoy the other meetings. Second day is going on. Thank you. Thank you.